give people a chance to get settled down um, a little bit and to grab a seat. Hello, I'm Brian Hansen. I'm the Associate Director of the Buffett Center for International and Comparative Studies, and I welcome you here uh, for our talk today, which is part of our talk series on international development, the most recent one uh, we had uh, previous to this. Uh, this term was in Matya Sen in April, and it's part of an ongoing program of the Buffett Center to raise important issues about international development, uh, not only to raise awareness and stimulate conversation about these issues, but also as part of an overarching set of programs um, that the Buffett Center supports, including uh, study abroad experiences to where students are engaged working with uh, with indigenous um, nonprofit organizations in India, Uganda, um, Bolivia, and, um, and also Nicaragua, as well as a number of student organizations that we try to help out and, and support who are also co-sponsors uh, for this event, including the Global Engagement Summit, uh, GlobeMed, and the Northwestern University Conference on Human Rights. We're very fortunate to have with us today Professor Paul Collier, and many of you know he's at Oxford University, where he's a professor of economics, a fellow at St. Anthony's College, and director of the Center for the Study of African Economies. Uh, in addition to his academic work, he has had a number of positions engaged in practical problems of development, including the time he served as the director of development research at the World Bank. Uh, he's an expert in political economy, in uh, development predicaments of poor countries, and known for his work um, on addressing the problems of the poorest countries in the world. Many of you know uh, a recent book of his called The Bottom Billion, in which uh, he really transformed in many ways the debate on development and put focus on uh, the folks who are at the bottom, uh, who are the bottom um, billion. And one of the things that I appreciate about uh, Professor Collier is that for a person who is very accomplished as an academic who works in international organizations at the highest level, he takes public discussion, public debate, and the role of individual citizens very, very seriously. And he has written a book that he's going to talk today that's called The Plundered Planet. And this book is a terrific book in many ways. I recommend it to you. There are copies that are available in the back of the room, um, as well as Professor Collier will be available to sign copies um, after the talk. But one of the things I admire about, about this book is that he's taken one of the hardest problems that faces us today, which is the tension between economic development providing new opportunities for growth, new economic opportunities for people around the world, together with the problem of the environment and trying to create sustainable growth paths that can provide at the same time uh, economic, um, economic uh, empowerment and possibilities for people to improve their lives while taking the environment very, very seriously and working on ways to try to reconcile this. One of the things that I admire in general about his work and this book too is that frequently he looks at issues that are polarized, where the public debate has got a very deadlocked character to it, and he looks for what can be a middle way forward. Where can we find paths to get out of deadlock and to find paths, uh, paths forward to actually do work and productively address the issues, the important issues that are, are facing this world. And um, this book is, uh, is, is his answer to that set of, set of issues. And I always find that while I may not always agree with everything that uh, all the arguments and positions he takes, that he is making serious arguments that need to be taken seriously, that need to be grappled with and provide ways to move forward. So please join me in welcoming Paul Collier here today. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, and thanks very much for coming. Um, looking at you, you're just the sort of people I'm trying to reach. Um, I'm going to try and persuade you that The Plundered Planet is, is the most important book that I've written. I think it is. 
Um, and I also want to persuade you why you're an important audience, um, why actually you have the power to make a difference. Um, so what's the planet planet about? It's about nature. Um, and as Brian said, it's an attempt to build some common ground between cat and dog, cat and dog are being environmentalists and economists. Um, I'm an economist, I'm married to an environmentalist, so I've lived, <laughs> I've lived cat and dog, but actually we seem to get on very well. Um, I'm going to try and build common ground, but it's not going to be a soft, mushy swamp, right? I'm going to try and build a robust center on which enough people can coalesce to change policy. And that means we're going to lose the fringes. Right? So let me wave bye-bye to the fringes right now. Right? Um, amongst the environmentalists, I'm going to part company from the fundamentalists. And by the fundamentalists, I mean the people who seem to put nature as more important than people. If people are for nature, you're not going to like what I've got to say. Right? And we're also going to lose some of the economist fundamentalists who, in their models, make no distinction between nature and any other economic activity. So we're going to lose those two extremes. And we're going to try and borrow stuff, insights from environmentalism and insights from economics, and try and build a robust common ground. So first insight from the environmentalists, nature is special. We've already lost the fundamentalist economists. <laughs> Bye-bye. Right? But why is nature special? You know, the fundamentalist environmentalist, it's almost a new religion amongst young people, right? That you want to sort of preserve nature for its own sake, right? Nature's the new deity to be admired and preserved and all that. That's not me, right? Nature's special because natural assets have no natural owners. The normal process in which we create an asset you write a book or whatever, the process of creating it defines the initial ownership rights. Natural assets are not created by us, they're just there. And so there's no defined ownership rights. They have to be constructed socially. And that, is an, that act of constructing rights of ownership is an act of governance. If there's no act of governance, the assets just hang there, they're valuable, and therefore they're vulnerable. Because they're vulnerable, they get plundered. Now plunder is a, is a big emotive word, and I'm a pedantic little economist, so I'm going to, having, having let the word out, I'm now going to rein it in and define it. I'm going to give two precise meanings to plunder. One is where the few expropriate what should belong to the many. And anybody who's studied, studied development will have seen that form of plunder again and again. The plunder of nature. Local elites align with foreign resource extraction companies to expropriate what should benefit all citizens. But the environmentalists have something very different in mind when they talk of plunder. There they're concerned about the present generation expropriating what should belong to the future. And both of these activities, the few stealing from the many, the present stealing from the future, these are both plunder. Both of those forms of behavior happen in the absence of proper governance of natural assets. So, 
Where is nature most undergoverned? If we look globally, there are two huge holes in governance of nature. And I'm going to, my talk's going to be around those two holes and what can be done about them. One hole is in the poorest societies on earth, what I call the countries of the bottom billion. They typically, not invariably, but typically, they have weak governance. They also have natural assets that loom very large in their societies relative to anything else in the society. The natural assets are much more valuable than anything else around. And so weak governance is stressed beyond endurance by the struggle to control these valuable natural assets. Weak governance is stressed beyond endurance. It produces plunder. The other hole in governance is those natural assets and liabilities that don't have the decency to respect our man-made frontiers. They are transnational. The fish of the oceans they don't swim around with little passports. The carbon of the skies. The natural resources that are under the oceans. The natural resources that are under the Arctic and the Antarctic. These are hugely valuable natural assets and very big natural liabilities in the case of carbon. To date, what saved them from being plundered is that we haven't had the technology to get up. Okay. Over the next few decades, technology is advancing, and sometimes it's already advanced to the point where we can get up. And technology without governance is just going to produce the plunder to exhaustion of these natural assets. So those are the two holes in governance. That's not to say that the governance of nature elsewhere in the world is great. Often it's far from great. But those are the two really gaping holes. And so let me start with that first hole, the bottom billion. And I want to persuade you that this is, this is really the big issue for the poorest countries. And we're going to do it by giving you the one thing that you'll remember from this lecture in a year's time. And here goes. And we're going to start not with the poorest countries, but with the richest. We're going to take the club of all the rich countries in the world. Now, the club of all the rich countries in the world is called the OECD. And uh, between them, they account for about a quarter of the Earth's land surface. Yeah? So we're going to look at that quarter of the Earth's land surface. I'm going to take the typical square mile in the OECD, the rich man's club. And we're going to look at that square mile. Actually, we're going to look beneath that square mile. What's underneath that square mile? Well, the typical square mile of the OECD is $300,000 worth of subsoil assets, the minerals and stuff underneath that square mile. So that's the rich countries. And now we're going to move to the poor. To be concrete, we'll look at Africa. And we'll do the same thing, the average square mile of Africa. And let's look underneath it. What's underneath the average square mile? And to make it interesting, you're going to tell me. Right? So $300,000 in the rich countries, what is it in a poor country, in Africa? To make it manageable, I'm going to give you a choice. It could be, it could be less than the rich countries, and it could be more than the rich countries. And, and and you're going to vote, right? So who thinks that in Africa is less than the rich countries? And who thinks it's more than the rich countries? And the reason you're all going to remember it is that you're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, let me reassure you first that you're in good company. Huh? I, did, I, did, I did this same test last week in London. It was the annual meeting of the chief executives of all the big pension funds and investment funds in the world. 
250 of them, there was several trillion dollars worth of assets under management in the audience. These guys, they're, they're, they're responsible for kind of the, the pensions you'll eventually not get. And, <laughs> and so you'd hope that they would know something about kind of where the natural assets are. 250 people got it wrong. Right? And then also last week, I addressed all the big donors in the world in Paris. Uh, it was the annual meeting for the International Development Association, which is the World Bank's um, money. It was, the, it was the round to raise money for the World Bank. They got me to do the address. So I tried this out on them. Same thing, all wrong. So you're in good company. That, that's the good news, right? But not only are you wrong, I have to tell you, you're very wrong. Right? $300,000 for the rich countries, $60,000 for that average square mile of Africa. Now, why? What's going on? What's going on? Right? Very odd. Because if you think about it statistically, these are two huge chunks of the Earth's surface. You know, it's actually both about a quarter of the Earth's surface. Pretty unlikely that, I mean, the, the stuff underneath was formed millions of years ago by you know, these deep geological processes. Pretty odd if two pretty random quarters of the Earth's surface, the averages are so very different, must be purposive. So, there's only two possible explanations of its purposive. One is that God really doesn't like Africa. Right? And <laughs> everything we know about recent history of Africa, we cannot reject that possibility. Right? But the other possibility, the other possibility, and the other possibility, I have to admit, I sort of cheated. Because the figures I gave you were for known subsoil assets. You know, I tried to find the figures for unknown subsoil assets, and I just couldn't find them. <laughs> so, so knowing that, think for a minute, right? Why is the average different? Because there's been less search in Africa. There's just been a whole lot less search and discovery. There's just been a lot less investment in search. Almost certainly, the averages underneath Africa are at least the same as the OECD. Probably more, because the OECD has been digging the stuff out for 200 years. So Africa's probably got more, not less. Right? So now, what's the implications of that? Yeah. Well, global commodity prices are now very high, despite the fact that we're in the worst world recession for 80 years. Right? World commodity prices are high because of the development of all the emerging market economies, they're going to stay high forevermore. So there's a very powerful incentive now to look for natural resources. And where can firms look? There's, only, there's the last frontier. The last frontier is those undiscovered resources in Africa and the other countries of the bottom billion. It's not going to be $60,000 in a decade or two, it'll be that 300,000. That missing 240,000 will be discovered. Right? Now, what's the implication of that? It means that over the next decade or two, there'll be a tidal wave of money or a tidal wave of, of resources coming out of Africa. Right? Multiply by five what's coming out at the moment and you've got the order of magnitude. Right? And of course, you were all quite right in one sense to put your hands up, because already resource extraction is the big story for Africa. It's far more important than any other activity. Right? Multiply it by five. So this has the potential to be very good. Potentially, this is, Af after all, this could be Africa's own money, not money that they have to beg from us, not money that foreign companies are going to provide for them. This is their own money, potentially. Potentially, this is the finance that could transform them from poverty to moderate prosperity sustainably. That's the opportunity. And then we look at the history of resource extraction, and we say, not only will this be the biggest opportunity they've ever had, 
it will be the biggest missed opportunity. And of course, once missed, it's gone forever. These are depletable resources. Once they're gone, they're gone. So the next one to two decades will be the decisive moment in these, these countries' opportunities. So the vital thing is that history doesn't repeat itself. That history of plunder. Plunder type one, plunder type two. Now, the, the fassa, the glib remark is we learn from history that we learn nothing from history. And that's not true. Right? Um, if you read any of the pages in the last month about what's been happening in Europe, you'll notice that there's one big European society that has just said, whatever else happens, inflation, no. Right? We will not print money under any circumstance. That's Germany. Why are the Germans so adamantly opposed to inflation? Much more so than any other European country. Why? Because they lived through hyperinflation. Germany learned. And so learning is perfectly possible. It's perfectly possible in the societies of the bottom billion. They've been through decades of plunder. In all these societies, there are people determined that history shouldn't repeat itself. But that's easier said than done. In order for history not to repeat itself, a whole chain of decisions have to hold. It's that chain of decisions which determines whether natural resources get harnessed for sustained development. And there's no alternative, but I'm going to take you through the long march of that decision chain. Yeah? I'm going to bring you up to speed in about 10 minutes in what do these societies need to know in order to harness their natural assets. The first link in the chain you already know is broken. You just don't know that you know it. Because the first link in the chain, if you think about it for a minute, is discover your natural assets. The very fact that so few have been discovered relative to what's there tells you the discovery process has really gone wrong. I'm not going to talk about that because I think by hook or by crook, over the next decade it'll get fixed, probably by crook. Right? So let's move on to the next link in the chain. And the next link in the chain is to prevent plunder of type one, to capture a fair amount of those resources for the society. And the mechanism of capture means taxation, basically. How do you sell the rights to the resource extraction and how do you tax them? You know how resource extraction rights are typically sold at the moment. They're deals between a minister and a resource extraction company. And that faces two problems. There's a huge problem of agency, it's a polite term for corruption, and there's a huge problem of asymmetric information. That's a fancy economic way of saying that the company knows more than the government. Right? And there's a simple institutional technology for getting around that, which is called auctions. The genius of auctions is that the government doesn't need to know what the resources are worth as long as sufficient number of rival, well-informed companies are bidding against each other. Inadvertently in that bidding process, they reveal the true value. There's a lot more to how to conduct the sale of rights than that, but that's a place to start. Then, taxation. I was in Zambia recently, I talked to the tax authorities. They said, the truth is that the copper company pays far more than we can afford to pay for accountants. And so all the best accountants in the country are working for the copper company. What are they working to do to conceal taxable profits? Huh? That's their job. Huh? And all the best accountants are doing that. So a tax system has to be designed that is robust to that sort of behavior. Huh? It has to be taxing stuff that's pretty easy to observe. That link in the chain of capture for the society is broken and broken and broken at the moment. 
Let me give you one or two numbers. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, which incidentally is neither democratic nor a republic. Um, it's only recently been renamed the Congo, but never mind. Um, Eastern DRC exports gold. Um, the, the, the figures in the Financial Times are that uh, about a billion dollars a year of gold is exported from the DRC. So what is the flow from gold exports into revenues into the treasury of the DRC? $37,000. A billion going out, $37,000 flowing into the treasury. Now, of course, just because it flows into the treasury, those $37,000, doesn't mean it's all going to benefit ordinary citizens. So there's going to be another leakage. The billion first turns into $37,000 and then turns into not very many dollars at all in terms of actual benefits to ordinary people. That is plunder on the grand scale. And I could give you a list of other figures of similar orders of magnitude. So that's the second link in the chain. Let's move to the third link. The third link could be expressed succinctly as avoid the Niger Delta situation. The Niger Delta, a region, has been environmentally severely damaged by, resource, by oil extraction over the decades. And that has produced a reaction of anger and then organized violence. And now finally that organized violence has turned into claims of ownership of the oil. That the Delta wants to own the oil. Now that final move is very understandable. But it's actually wrong local communities should not own the natural resources that they sit on top of. And think about it, because one of my nightmares is that because the words local community are so warm and cuddly, that the, the environmentalist NGOs will say, that's what we want. And you know what? The resource extraction companies will say, we agree. Why would the resource extraction companies agree with that? Because what do the resource extraction companies want? They want tranquility where they're digging the stuff out. And who would lose by that deal of the locals own everything? The citizens of the country. Yeah? It's bad enough that Africa is chopped up into 53 different countries. That produces massive, but unfortunately unavoidable, inequalities in the luck of the draw. Little Sarotomi Principe, 100,000 people sitting on top of an oil field. Ethiopia, 80 million people sitting on top of nothing. That's bad enough, right? But if we go local claims, there's no end to it. Sarotomi Principe is actually two little islands, Sarotomi and Principe. Guess what? The, the people live on one and the oil's under the other. So. The 8,000 people who live on Principe, guess what they say? They say, it's not yours, it's ours, right? There's no limit to greedy claims for ownership if we go down that route of local, local, local. Yeah? We've got to arrest that process as best we can, and realistically that means all the citizens of a country have got to own the, the stuff. So, what should have been done to avoid the delta? Well, um, not granting ownership, but it, first of all addressing the environmental degradation. A lot of it was avoidable. And so the first step is minimize the environmental damage. The second step is compensate fully for the environmental damage. And the third is build robust and transparent processes by which the, 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 the inhabitants of the Delta know that they fully participate in the benefits that are going to all citizens. Which citizens should benefit? And here I'm going to draw another insight from environmentalism. It's the future. These things basically don't belong to the present, they belong to the future. We must respect the rights of the future. 
But what does that mean? Does that mean you've got to keep nature as it is? No. In a poor society, if it can convert natural assets into more productive invested assets, if it can turn oil into schools, into hospitals, into factories, into ports, which pull the society from poverty to prosperity, that's the ethical thing to do. You know, the ethical test is what's called a thought experiment. Thought experiments that are moral philosophy, what test tubes and stuff are to science. Right? And so here's the thought experiment. You've got to imagine yourselves as some future generation. If we're in Nigeria, it's a future generation of Nigerians. And as that future generation, you've got to say, are our rights being infringed by what this present generation is doing? Do we want that oil preserved in the ground, or do we want it to be used for the schools and the factories which will dig us out of poverty to prosperity? And in that case, the thought experiment's obviously going to give the answer, take the oil out of the ground. It's not always going to give that answer, incidentally. We'll come later to where it will give the opposite answer. Preservation is sometimes right. So, let me put an ethical framework on what we've just said. That our responsibilities to the future are not that we are curators of a set of natural artifacts which have to be put in a museum and handed to the future. We are not the curators of artifacts, we are the custodians of value. Natural assets are valuable. We, if we use them, we must hand on to the future at least equivalent value that is more productive, hopefully. That's, uh, that's the ethical test. Yeah? And it's important, it's just, I, I'm very keen to come and talk to you because the fundamentalist version of environmentalism, the, the curators of natural artifacts, is spreading like a virus amongst young people. And it's important to Yes, you want to be environmentalists and respect the future. But what does that mean? If, if you define it in this fundamentalist term of preserving nature intact, you are fundamentally opposed to the task of fighting global poverty. And we cannot afford the two great causes of humanity in the next few decades to be so at loggerheads. So we have to start with an ethics of nature which is reconcilable with the task of fighting global poverty. So there's that third link in the chain, avoiding the delta. Now we get to the hard links. The fourth link is, so the money's flowing in. We've got this billion dollars of gold actually flowing into the treasury in the DRC instead of just flowing out. What does the treasury do with the money? Now here's the choice. You can either spend it on consumption or you can save it, acquire assets. What's the answer? The answer is you've got to acquire assets. You've got to save it. Why? Because you're depleting a natural asset. And to respect the rights of the future, you've therefore got to build up some other asset. At the moment, that's often not happening. I just met the new finance minister of Nigeria three weeks ago. He's, he's a great guy, very, very clever. He was a managing director of Goldman Sachs until three weeks ago. I told him, I told him you're moving to a better ethical environment by moving from Goldman Sachs to the, <laughs> the government of Nigeria. Um, but, but his first question to me was very encouraging. He said, um, he said are we saving enough? out of the oil revenue. You know how much Nigeria is saving out of the oil revenue at the moment? All the oil revenue just covers recurrent expenditures. Right? Savings, zero. Right? And that's been the history of Nigeria ever since the discovery of oil in 1970, with one exception, the period 2003 to 7, and this feisty woman, Ngozi Nkonjo Iweala, who you probably read about, 
she became finance minister. When she became finance minister, she discovered that actually the oil revenues weren't even enough to cover recurrent expenditure. She realized that was crazy. So she slammed up the savings rate just in time for the oil boom. And it was brilliant. She managed to get rid of Niger When she came in, Nigeria had $30 billion worth of debts. Four years later, when she left, there were no debts, and there was $70 billion in the foreign exchange reserves. So $100 billion of swing in just four years. It is possible for poor countries to be prudent with their natural resource revenues. Right? So that's what needs to happen. What should be done with those savings? And here, the, uh, the, the one business model in town is Norway. And, uh, and what Norway does is give its money to those wise New York bankers to invest. And that makes a lot of sense for Norway, at least it makes some sense for Norway. Um, and the reason it makes sense for Norway to acquire foreign financial assets rather than invest in its own society is that Norway already has more invested capital per worker than any other society on Earth. And of course, in Sierra Leone, it's the opposite. I, I, I was in Sierra Leone in December. It just hits you in the face. This is a country that has had no investment for 40 years. You get to Freetown, 40 years ago, it was a small town. Now, it's a big city in terms of people, because during the Civil War, everybody flooded into the town to be safe. There's no infrastructure. There's just people. It, this place needs massive amounts of investment. And so Sierra Leone's just discovered oil. It will be obscene for Sierra Leone to acquire foreign financial assets, capital in America. It needs to have it in Sierra Leone. And that takes us to the final and most difficult link in the chain, how do you do that? Because one reason why Sierra Leone and other countries like it haven't had much investment is they haven't built the capacity to invest productively. And so that final link in the chain is build back capacity. The lack of capacity to invest productively is called by the IMF an absorptive capacity limit. And for years, the IMF has used that as an argument for saying, therefore, put the money abroad. Right? And their statement of the problem is right, and their solution is completely wrong. As I hasten to add, they've now accepted. Right? That the right thing to do is to change the absorptive capacity. Build the capacity. It's what I call investing in investing building the capacity to invest productively. And that's not easy. There's a whole chapter on it in the book, but I'm not going to go into it. So here's the decision chain. It is a chain. If any of the links in that chain break, you've got a broken chain. You can't drag the society from poverty to prosperity. You've got plunder. And so how do you get that whole decision chain to hold, and hold not just once, but again and again, for a generation. There's no quick fixes in economics. It takes a generation to move from poverty to moderate prosperity. Right? So there's the challenge. Get that decision chain to hold again and again. How? And we're going to park that question and move, at the other, move to the other hole in global governance. And that other hole in global governance, remember, is those transnational assets and liabilities the carbon of the skies, the, all the rest of it. I'm going to take something that you might not know that much about. It's a little transnational asset problem. It's fish. Right? I'm going to take fish partly because you probably don't know much about it. Partly it only takes five minutes to know. Uh, and partly it's a horrific story. Once you've spent that five minutes, it makes you want to weep. Right? Um, so we're going to spend that five minutes now on fish, right? Fish is going to be a, a microcosm of a much larger universe of transnational, uh, 
natural assets. Right? So here's the story of fish. Until a few decades ago, there was no, there was no problem with fish. And that was because we didn't have the technology to catch them very well. And so anybody could go out and catch a fish. No problem, they just renew themselves, they're there forever. Right? And then we get better and better at catching fish. You know, we're now super at catching fish. We've got the most wonderful fish catching technology. It's not, it's not rods and lines. It's, it's more like a, a giant hoover. You go out with your industrial chore roller and it's a floating hoover and you go, right? And there are no fish. Fantastic efficient. Right? Now, the only problem is if we unleash that technology without restraint, um, there will be no fish. Um, by the time it's no longer efficient to find the last few fish, uh, they can't find each other. And so there's no breeding. Right? There's a threshold below which, once you get down to it, the fish stop breeding. Right? And so uh, if we do that, um, our grandchildren won't have fish. Right? Bye bye fish. Now, let's try that thought experiment again. Right? So now put ourselves in the position of the future and we say, is it, are our rights being infringed if this present generation eats the last fish? And the present generation says to us, well, we know our obligation is to pass on values, so we're going to give you other stuff apart from fish. We're, we're going to give you a lot of video games, right? <laughs> and what's the future going to say? Uh, it's going to say, no thanks, we want the fish, right? That's why you've got to be pragmatic environmentalists. You've got to look Natural asset by natural asset. Nigeria's oil, if it can get that decision chain right, use the oil up. Same sometime with forests, right? London used to be a forest. Thank God somebody chopped it down and built London, right? We don't regret that. Right? <laughs> so sometimes the right thing to do with a natural asset is use it. Right? And sometimes, as with fish, the right thing to do is preserve it. So, are we preserving fish? Well, in order to preserve fish, we would have to regulate the offtake. We'd have to s control these floating hoovers. Right? If we did that, if we limited the fish catch, we would create what economists call rents. The value of a fish will be more than the cost of catching it. The way to understand rents is to think of a barrel of oil. On average, it costs $7 to get a barrel of oil out of the ground. The cost of capital, the cost of risk, the cost of labor. Once you've got it out, it's worth about $70. So $63 of that is rent. It's just the intrinsic value of the oil, right? over and above the cost of getting it. Fish, once we limit the catch, they're going to have a rent. Right? The whole fishing industry is worth about $80 billion a year. And at a conservative guess, about 20 billion of that will be rent. That's the number I use in a book. I just got an email yesterday from a, a specialist team trying to work this out. And they say, oh, we think you've underestimated. It's more like 50 billion. But I like to be conservative in numbers, right? So 20 billion of rents. So who should own those 20 billion of rents? Well, there's no earthly reason why it should go to fishermen. They're going to get paid for their capital, their labor, their risk. Why should they own the rents, right? The arguments that fishermen use is, well, we used to be able to catch fish, so we should have the rights to catch them in the future. False argument, eh? false ethics. It's a misunderstanding of the economics of scarcity. Once the technology is advanced to the point where you actually have to create scarcity and therefore rents, the rents shouldn't accrue. The rights of the fact that you caught them in the past doesn't give you rights to the future. Incidentally, the same argument applies to carbon emissions. The Chinese cannot ethically say, just because you emitted some carbon in the past, we should be able to emit as much carbon as we like in the future. No. Right? It's just ethically mistaken. So who should that $20 billion of rents accrue to? Well, no natural owners of natural assets, but it might as well belong to all of us. Right? In some sense, it belongs to all of us. Fishermen catching these valuable fish with the rents in them should be paying us $20 billion a year. Yeah? 
Instead, we are paying them $30 billion a year in fishing subsidies. Yeah? So instead of them paying us, we're paying them. What, it gets worse. What, what do they do with that $30 billion of fishing subsidies each year? What do they do with it? They catch fish. Yeah? In other words, we are financing the plunder of the fish. We are financing the fact that our grandchildren will have no fish. And then it gets worse than that, because instead of them paying us 20 billion and us paying them 30 billion, you'd think that would at least produce a few billionaires. But no, because it doesn't even produce rich fishermen. What it produces is massively, it's what's called rent-seeking, a massively inefficiently large fishing fleet. The global fishing fleet is at least double what is needed to catch the fish. And so the rents are dissipated in this huge, wasteful fishing fleet. OK, that's the fish story. It's kind of sad. Right? I, mean, I mean, we're wasting a huge amount of money, and we're going to have no fish. So you don't have to be a saint just to think we're doing this wrong. Right? I mean, the, the world has just not got fish right. And we better try and get it right, otherwise there'll be no fish. Right? We could get it right and save ourselves a huge amount of money in the process. Right? We could save ourselves about $50 billion a year. That's half the global aid budget. You know, I mean, it's, so now here's the, the punchline. If we can't get fish right, We've no hope at all of getting the other natural assets right. Because the other stuff is much more complicated, much more valuable, and therefore there are much more powerful lobbies advocating the wrong things. Okay? So the challenge is how are we going to get fish and the other transnational assets and liabilities right? And now I'm going to come back, I'm going to answer that question, that problem and that problem I parked. How are the bottom billion going to get that whole decision chain right again and again and again? Because the solution to these two problems turns out to be the same. And the solution is there is no substitute for building a critical mass of informed opinion, society by society. The countries of the bottom billion what would a critical mass be? Sometimes it will be a majority of voters. More often, it'll just be a few thousand people enough to get these decisions right instead of getting them wrong. What will it take to get fish right? Well, again, it doesn't have to be everybody everywhere. In the case of fish, it has to be a critical mass of people in the societies that are eating the fish. Who's eating the fish? America, Europe, Japan. There's not a lot of places. Right? We've got to get up to speed on understanding that if we carry on eating the fish like we're doing, without restraint, there won't be any fish. Right? Now, how do we build that critical mass of informed opinion? First of all, note it's not ethically that demanding. This, right? We don't all have to be saints. We just have to be something other than greedy blocks of stone that doesn't care a damn about the future. We just have to be, in other words, normal human beings. And we have to get up to speed on the science and the economics so that we combine normal human concern about the future with some intelligence. That's the package that has to be a critical mass, society by society. And now for the good news. It's very much easier to build that critical mass than it used to be, very much easier. Why? Because information technology is on our side. Let me close with a really encouraging example. And it's gonna, it's gonna be from a society that's actually, unfortunately, more, in, more repressive than pretty well any of the societies of the bottom billion and certainly than our own, and that's China. You remember that two years ago, in China there were earthquakes 
and schools collapsed and killed school children. And the reason those schools collapsed was that there'd been a lot of corruption. The building regulations hadn't been enforced. There'd been bribery and corruption, the building regulations ignored. Within 48 hours of those earthquakes, ordinary Chinese citizens had managed to do three things. First, they'd used the web to find out why their schools were collapsing. Second, they'd worked out who within their local government had taken the bribes that led the, the schools to collapse. And three, still within 48 hours, they'd organized amongst themselves protests against those officials. There's a wonderful photo on the web of a Chinese local government official on his knees before a crowd of angry parents. If that was possible two years ago in China, think what can be possible in the societies of the bottom billion over the next decade. In terms of information technology, they are not backwards. Google recently sent a team to Kenya not to teach the Kenyans about the new mobile phone networking technology, but to learn from Kenyans how it was done. These societies have leapfrogged into the new information technology. So what can we do? We can help to spread like a virus the information that they need. In my role as a private citizen, I floated in the bottom billion the idea of getting a natural resource charter. And enough people read the bottom billion that a group came together and said, that's doable, let's do it. There's now a natural resource charter on the web, naturalresourcecharter.org. Right? And it sets out the simple terms that whole decision chain I described. That's why I wrote The Plunder Planet, is to try and get out in simple terms the information that a critical mass of people need. Please read it. Please become the catalysts of that process of change. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have an opportunity for uh, discussion and some questions, and I want to open it up. What I'm going to ask you to do is, uh, since I don't see mics in the aisle, I'll ask you to speak very, very loudly, and then ask Paul to repeat the question so that um, folks know uh, what has been asked. Who'd like to kick things off here? Right here up front, please. So the question is, does it matter if the future generations don't have fish? Well, the best we can do is to ask them. Or, and the way, the way to do that is this thought experiment, right? We take ourselves into the future and think, would, would we want our grandchildren to grow up not knowing fish, you know? Um, it, it's, it's going to be a judgment call for each person. But I think in that case, most people would say, it's crazy. The future is going to be richer anyway. Of course, it'll want fish. Right? The example you gave, which is we used to have agricultural jobs, we don't have agricultural jobs. Um, that's a very different kettle of fish because I work a lot in societies where there are a lot of peasant farmers. Um, I also live in Britain where there's a lot of romantic aristocrats like Prince Charles who want to preserve those peasant farmers in aspic. Right? The aristocracy loves these holistic, organic peasant farmers who are so deferential, you know? They'd love to go back to the 18th century. But if you actually talk with these organic, holistic peasant farmers, and especially their kids, you know what? Their kids want to go to towns. They don't want to stay in this rural bliss. It's actually boring and, and miserizing, right? They want. Uh, a, a brighter life. And so the, the decay, the loss of all that agricultural employment, these people are going to see in the future as a big plus. Right? The loss of fish, I think not. Right? Terrific. Right over here, please.
Yeah. Um, first of all, um, elites are changing. There are, there are good people in emerging. Um, so uh, one reason why there were a lot of crooks in power was that uh, we connived at that. I mean, let me tell you a little story. Um, thanks to America, America was in the lead here. Um, over a decade ago, America pioneered uh, anti-corruption, anti-bribery laws. It said it was illegal for Americans to bribe uh, officials in developing countries. And then, because America had taken that lead, other countries had to follow suit. So across the OECD, all countries adopted that legislation. The next battlefront was then to enforce that legislation. My own country, Britain, was a disgrace. In the following 10 years, it brought only one prosecution. I know about it because the Serious Fraud Office got me as the expert witness. And why was there that case? Because the management of the company changed, discovered that the previous management had been corrupt up to the eyeballs, and said, came to the Serious Fraud Office and said, please prosecute us so we can clean this thing up. Right? Now, the Serious Fraud Office got me to testify, and I was supposed to say, well, the cost of corruption here was that the, the, the bridges that were built cost an extra 15%. So it was, it was $7 million wasted. I didn't say that at all. Here's what I said. That $7 million that was the 15% went to a guy who was a middle-ranking official in the Ministry of Public Works. What did he do with that $7 million? He didn't spend it on high living. He invested it. He invested it in political power. He decided he wanted a political career. And with his $7 million, he became an, a member of parliament. And he rose in his party. By the time this case came to court, he was his country's minister of transport. Now, first of all, the cost of having a crook as your minister of transport is very much higher than $7 million. And secondly, and here's the killer point, it was this little British company paying this bribe that meant that we got a crook there that had crowded out some honest guy who might otherwise have been the Minister of Transport. And so the leadership that these countries have is in part dependent upon our behavior. And our behavior in the past has been pretty atrocious. Right? So one thing is there are decent leaders. Things are improving. Another is that even not so decent leaders can sometimes see that plunder is not a great idea. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to Angola um, to address Angolans on this issue. And uh, I, it was most of the audience was government ministers and officials was supposed to be addressing civil society. There are only six civil society, but never mind. So I put it to, to these guys that actually, if they wanted to see the future of Angola with all its oil, they could see Angola in 30 years' time just by buying two sets of airline tickets for the cabinet, and these would be a very good investment. I said, book yourselves 30 airline tickets to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and you can see what Angola might be in 30 years, and also book yourself um, 30 airline tickets to Lagos in Nigeria, and you can see what uh, Angola could be in 30 years. And let me tell you, at the moment, not only you, but the entire citizenry of Angola is booked on that plane to Nigeria. That's what you'll be in 30 years' time on your present course. Now, I said that basically to the governing elite. Um, I then discovered that after that, they invited the government of Malaysia to come and tell them what to do. Right? So even elites can decide that plunder's not a great idea. Right? So that, that, that's, uh, um, finally, let me, let me give you an example from Sierra Leone. Um, I just got a message last week from somebody who'd been in Sierra Leone very recently. I, I was there in December, but they'd met with the uh, chief secretary to the president. And they said, my God, this guy was completely up to speed on this decision chain. He knew it. You know? So people can learn. 
that there's a hunger for avoiding the repetition of history. So it's not all hopeless. Yeah, I, I use the term moderate prosperity because um, quite a lot of people are kind of hostile to the idea of, uh, of global prosperity. Um, and there's even a sentiment that, you know, sort of the poor better stay poor because we can't afford everybody to live like we do. Um, well, it's true we can't afford everybody to live exactly like we do. We can afford uh, a future that's pretty prosperous. Um, our own lives are going to have to adapt. Our own lives are adapting all the time as relative prices change. You know, I mean, any European will look at America and say, how can you be so wasteful of energy? You know, I mean, energy is much more expensive in Europe. Um, that hasn't destroyed Europe's life cycle. Right? We're not back in the Stone Age, at least not yet. Um, the, it's possible to live perfectly well um, and yet emit a lot, use a lot less energy, and certainly emit a lot less carbon, right? Um, but the, the, the reason I use the word moderate prosperity is that our level of prosperity isn't on the menu for the poorest societies. What's on the menu for them is if the, the next 30 years are like the past 30 years, what's on the menu for them is continued grinding poverty. And so it's a vital matter that these countries at the bottom billion catch up. And this is their big opportunity. How far will they catch up? They'll get to middle income status. Middle income status means that people have the ability to leave, lead a, a life of, of modest material decency. Right? And, and we, should, we, should be, we should be delighted that that's feasible. And, and never be tempted into this language of the world will collapse if, if people reach this moderate material decency. Right? It won't. I mean, that's, that's a reasonable sentiment, but it, it's not reasonable to leap from that to the conclusion that we've got to preserve everything as it is. Right? That, um, we've got to balance risks, basically. The risk of preserving everything as it is, we can see those risks very clearly. Global population rising to 9 billion, a lot of people still in dire poverty, a world of, of mass inequality with a big population, with not enough food, it's going to be very alarming, right? So preservation has a lot of risks. Right? Using, touching anything generates some risks. We've been living with those risks for, you know, for, for millennia. We've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to have to take some risks in order to avoid other bigger risks. But should we, be, should we just with gay abandon tear things up? No. I've got a chapter in the, the Plunder Planet which, which tackles the, the question of the Brazilian rainforest. And Brazilian rainforest, I end up arguing we should, it should be preserved. And there are, it's really complicated, uh, the Brazilian rainforest. There are, there are three or four different layers of ethical considerations. And let me just sketch them a bit. One is, is that cutting down the rainforest it's just like taking out oil, that it can benefit a lot of poor people. There's a lot of poor Brazilians, and so if that was the only consideration, cut it down, benefit poor Brazilians, you'd probably want to cut it down. Right? Another consideration is, as you cut the rainforest down, you emit a hell of a lot of carbon dioxide, and that's, uh, 
a loss, it's a liability that's being generated to the whole world in the future. And so that's a, a case where Brazilians might be perfectly happy, but they're damaging the rest of the world. Yeah? And then there's a third layer, which to me is decisive, is that the rainforest is the home of people who know no other world. Now, let's go through that thought experiment of could we compensate the people who live in that rainforest for the destruction of their world? Suppose some passing Martian spaceship spots the Earth and says, ooh, just what we need, right? Um, we, we, wanna, we don't want to be unethical. We, we'll, yeah, we've got to destroy the Earth to get what we need because we want the stuff that's in the middle, but, um, but we've got to compensate you all. Don't worry, right? Um, we're going to give you each 17,000 wheel bobs, right? So you'll be all right, don't worry. You know, you can, you can go and live on Pluto and you, you're going to have 17,000 little pops each, you know. And, and, and what's our answer going to be to that? We don't want that, we want Earth. This is our home, right? Always the confrontation between modernity and indigenous peoples has been fraught with pain and we've been very cavalier over that confrontation. I don't want to preserve the peoples of the rainforest in Aspic, but I think they should be allowed to adjust, to integrate with the rest of humanity at their pace, not at ours. And so regardless of poor Brazilians, regardless of the future, that to my mind, they have an absolute right to the preservation of their world, because if we destroy it, it's uncompensatable for them. Yeah, so the question is about um, the uh, sort of renewable energy technologies. Um, and there are, there are many renewable energy technologies. And, and again, we, we shouldn't be romantic, right, you know? The, uh, there's, a, there's a degree of anti-science romanticism, which is much stronger in Europe than America. But the, the European romantic environmentalist movement says, no, 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 to nuclear power, no, no, no to genetically modified crops, you know? and, and this, is, um, this is very dangerous, emotivism. Um, we need uh, all the technologies we can get, and so we need the, the renewables of the wind. There is no single fix for, for the energy problem. We need them all. We need solar. Solar can eventually become really, really cheap. It takes a while. Right? Um, we need wind, we need nuclear, and in food, we need biofuels. I'm, so, so, I'm sorry, we need genetically modified crops. Let, let, let me backtrack on that, because let, I nearly said something terrible. Right? <laughs> um, um, what Africa needs to feed itself in the face of rising population and deteriorating climate is rapid crop adaptation. Rapid crop adaptation comes from genetically modified organisms. That's a, a useful technology to speed crop adaptation, right? And so we shouldn't be anti-science. We should say, that's the technology that we better need, that we need. It might carry some risks. Nobody's been able to find any risks so far, but it might carry some risks, but we, by God, if we don't get rapid product, crop adaptation, we face very big risks. The balance of risk has changed over the last 14 years since Europe and Africa banned GMOs. Right? So Europe banned GMOs because of the standard bit of European agricultural protectionism combined with the sort of anti-science nuttiness of the romantic environmentalists 
like Prince Charles. Sorry, Prince Charles, <laughs> your highness. Um, but um, America's equivalent folly is this biofuel scam. Right? And I, uh, I realize that saying this in Chicago is not the most uh, um, tactful thing to say, but um, if you want to grow your way out of energy dependence upon the Middle East, the right place to grow biofuels is Brazil. Right? Sugarcane into energy makes some sense. Grain into energy makes no sense. It doesn't even make environmental sense. All that grain into energy did was take out a great chunk of the world's food supply. And so the world's poor were faced with one folly, which was your folly, which took out a great chunk of food supply, and then the European folly, the ban on GMOs, which took out gradually a great chunk of European food supply because European food productivity slid about 1.5% a year behind American food productivity. And with these two great slugs of food supply being taken out, that contributed to the world food crisis of 2008. Who suffered from that food crisis? Not people in America and Europe. We weren't the ones to go hungry. The ones to go hungry were the poor families in the cities of the third world. Right? And within the poor families, who suffered most? It was the children, right? the young children. In fact, if that food crisis had lasted for two years, the young children in the poor urban families would have experienced what's called stunting. It takes two years of malnutrition to get stunting. Stunting is a permanent condition, and it's not just physical. It's mental as well. And so we would have done irreversible damage by our follies, our European folly, and our American folly, these romantic fantasies, grow your way out of dependence on the Middle East, anti-science, ban GMOs, you know? Th this romanticism has real consequences, and not for us, but for the poorest people on Earth. That's why our envir environmentalism must be allied with an understanding of the science and the economics. Emotivism without science can be dangerous. The history of fundamentalism is a long and dangerous history, and we mustn't repeat it. I, uh, I very seldom speak about my own motivation. You know, as, um, but let me answer your question. Right? Um, there are two groups of Africanists, at least in Britain. 99% right? of the Africanists in Britain, their daddies were governors generals or district commissioners or their granddaddies, and they think of Africa as this wonderful, different place, uncontaminated by modernity, 
and they want to keep it that way. Right? And then there's 1% as people like me. Right? Um, I'm a poor boy made good. Both, both my parents left school when they were 12 years old. They had very hard lives as manual workers. Right? And they had very frustrating lives. You know, my dad was a really clever guy, so was my mum, leaving school age 12. They never had any opportunity to break out of the mundane jobs that they had. And when I come to Africa, I see my mum and dad writ large a million and millions of times over of people trapped in the frustrating lives that poverty brings. And so I want to change that. I want to do what I can to open up the economic opportunities which have transformed America and transformed Europe. And so that's what brings me to Africa. It's, it's, it's to say, I don't want to preserve Africa as some wonderland of difference. I just want to bring the opportunities that Africans have so, so far so often been denied. So do you see Africa leaders you know, looking the same way in starting to adopt the position to a certain degree? No, I don't, um, to be honest. I, I see um, Western political leaders using Africa um, to, uh, to indulge in a, a cheap bit of gesture politics of showing how good they are, you know, that they, they fly into Africa, kiss a couple of babies, get it in the front pages, and they fly back. That's why I wrote The Bottom Billion, because I thought the only way of stopping that is to build in our own societies the critical mass of people who recognize that that's not good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me tell you, politicians are much more frightened of you than they are of me. And um, you swim in the new information technology. I don't. Right? At Oxford, I dressed a bunch of students on the planet, planet, and I said, you know, I'm trying to ignite this process of uh, of, of building building this critical mass of informed opinion, both with Planet Planet and with this natural resource charter that we've got. And at the end, uh, a young woman came up to me and said, uh, I suppose it's on YouTube, is it? And, and I said, I don't know. Um, she sent me an email the next morning saying, it is now. And uh, you, know, you, you, you don't even realize, you swim in waters that, that, that my generation do not take to naturally. Right? You know, there's this famous thing of six degrees of separation, that one person is separated from any other person on Earth by six degrees of separation. You know what? We've now got a technology for the first time that can span that six degrees of separation fast. Right? And so students are the perfect people. What is going to be the critical mass in the societies of the bottom billion? It's going to be students, probably. Right? You reach other students, and they'll make a difference. Yeah. Within 10 years, those students will be in a positions of influence over these decisions. Yeah. And so you're in a position to spread this, this viral process. Instead of it just being trivia that spread, let's try and spread something that actually matters. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, let me answer that first. I think that's quite likely. I think the, um, um, there was a very good line back in the 1970s when it was the last time the world was worried it was going to run out of oil. And uh, Sheikh Yemeni said, well, the, the Stone Age didn't end because the world ran out of stone. You know? And, and, um, and the, the, the oil age is not going to end because the world runs out of oil. It's, it's, it's the technology is going to move on. Sometimes technology makes nature, usually, on average, technology makes nature more valuable. But sometimes it makes nature less valuable. The big natural assets of the 19th century, no, nitrates and stuff, no longer valuable. And that's obviously what's going to happen with oil. And the big losers from that will be the, the countries that then own these huge stocks of oil. Um, so that's another reason why it's a sort of short-term window that these countries have got. Um, they either convert those assets productively now, or even the, the natural value will, will erode. Right? So, so I agree with that. Um, that's not a reason for not developing the new technologies, but it's, uh, it's another reason for saying to them, you know, you've got a one-shot opportunity of the next one or two decades to use this stuff. Um, the, um, uh, the question about the, the young people and the concerns of the future, yeah, there's a, the, the, my favorite part, the part, part I most enjoyed writing in, in The Plunder Planet um, is, uh, is my own son's uh, first realize, his first political statement. And he, he made this a year ago when he was eight years old. He came home and he'd, what he'd done, he'd learned, he was in tears, uh, but not tears of sorrow, tears of rage. And they were directed against me. And, and not, not as his father, not that I'd done anything as his father. It, they were again, directed against me as a representative of the older generation. And what he'd been taught at school about the Brazilian rainforest. And he was angry. He was angry that before he, he was old enough to have influence, the rainforest was going to be gone. And it was my generation that was plundering it. And. Uh, He's seen me on television, so he's got a rather inflated view of my influence. So he came home and he literally screamed at me, tell the president. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that did get me thinking about, it, it actually opened up a whole chapter on, on why is it that little Daniel felt that he had rights over the rainforest which were being infringed when he'd never seen it, uh, and yet he didn't feel he got rights over our neighbor's fancy new car, um, which he sees every day. So they'd opened up really quite an interesting sort of philosophical line of thought about w what are our rights over nature. Um, why am I, um, I think, more optimistic than, than you as to, as to the power of turning that sort of anger into action? Um, it's that I think in the... You see, in the, in the case of things like fish, um, it's that really it's still only a small minority of people who actually understand the issues. You might understand the issues, but not many people do. Um, and once you understand the issues, then I think a large majority of people would say, no, we need to do something about this. We just need to do something about and doing something about it, as with all proper management of nature, does not mean tearing our lives up. This is, again, a, a great damage that the, the sort of romantic environmentalists have done, because the romantic environmentalists do actually want to return to the 18th century. Eh? They liked it. And so their antipathy to modernity you know, they're basically rubbing their hands and saying, aha, modernity's getting its comeuppance, you can't all live like that. And so most people react to that with fear. They say, well, we don't want to, you know, we want to hang on to a decent lifestyle. And of course the reality is that 
We don't have to return to the 18th century to look after nature properly, to look after our responsibilities to the future properly. We have to do relatively modest things, but we have to do them. And so the people have been frightened. They're ignorant and they're frightened because the romantics have exaggerated the cost of doing something about the problem. And so we need to build up this, you know, this sensible center which knows the science, knows the economics, knows that it's manageable, but has the, the energy that young people, that people like my son Daniel have, those burning tears of anger. We need to ally the burning tears of anger with the science.